Healthcare. We can all agree is vitally important to the health and well-being of our society. It is something we rely upon if we get seriously ill, contracting viruses or if we end up in an accident resulting in serious injury, fatal wound, broken bones or anything else that may threaten our lives. Under this interpretation, one can easily misconstrue healthcare as a right. However, as I argue, this is a gross misunderstanding of what rights are. When someone says healthcare is not a right, they are not saying you don't deserve access to affordable healthcare. One of the biggest fallacies misconstrued in the study of economics is the belief that from face value, if someone claims there is free or public healthcare, it must therefore be more affordable, which is simply not true. In fact, it's a misunderstanding of economics, much similar of the failure of people have in understanding the broken window fallacy. Where do we draw such a comparison between someone's narrow perspective of viewing something free or public ownership being more affordable from face value to that of the broken window fallacy. Perhaps I'll cover the broken window fallacy separately for another time, but in short, the socialist really only sees the outside, they only see the broken window, they do not see what is behind the closed doors and the loss to the third party business in the background. This is no different to that of the perception of public ownership in the word free, whether the Debating a Keynesian or a Marxist, they have been so heavily indoctrinated to believe that it is more affordable because they were told persistently that it is free, available for everyone, and that it is not a for profit system. As if that's supposed to be something good. Much like Goebbels of Nazi Germany said that if you repeat a lie over and over, people will begin to believe it to be true, which is why you have the flawed belief if it is publicly owned, that must follow that it is more affordable. There is no analysis for where the money comes from to pay for the free stuff. It's merely just a case that if they say it is free, it must be true that it is free. And even if they concede that tax money pays for such free services, there's part of the concession. Of course, there is never enough funds from the taxpayers to pay for it and you tell these people the government has to take from elsewhere in the economy by cutting back elsewhere in order to pay for it. This goes flying over their head. They literally stare at you like deer in headlights. This then follows the bold assumption that if something is privately run, it must mean it's expensive because it's run for profits. If you wish for an example for this, check out my response video on Sean's argument on privatisation of railways. I covered in a separate video responding to Fox on why American healthcare costs are expensive, but I felt the video was slightly out of focus and I wish to do a video remake covering a bit more detail in editing. Going back to the argument on healthcare being a right, if there is such acknowledgement of the fact that taxpayers' money is used to pay for such public services, then that then follows they require thieving from individuals by forcing them, the individuals into a collective group to pay for the publicly run healthcare. Again, you can check my argument on taxation is theft. No one can claim to have a right to what you work hard for, for your own earnings. If someone claims they have a right to something, ask them who has the duty. The fact is, an individual who works for the healthcare system has their own individual rights to agree to disagree, therefore they have the right to refuse service. The question must then follow, what right do I have to subordinate the individual's rights to that of my own? The answer is, no one can claim their rights are more important than that of another individual's rights. They cannot claim the moral high ground. The individual who works for the healthcare system is not your slave. Socialists are very good at taking things twisting it and taking it out of context and making baseless assertions and claims. For example, if you support the privatisation of the NHS, you only care for the rich. Just because I argue logically that individuals have their own rights and that healthcare is not a right does not mean to say that I do not believe in more affordable healthcare or healthcare being accessible for the masses. A moral argument for healthcare would therefore be a free market and again, with that statement follows a baseless assumptions. 
People wrongly assume that the main American healthcare market today is somehow capitalist. In other words, free market. Nothing could be farther from the truth. A sceptical human argues ludicrously about the happiness index, never mind the fact that there is an obsession socialists have turning to Scandinavian countries as these socialist utopias. We all know the reason for why that is. A following quote by a fellow Brit, Michael Booth, sums up how deeply flawed the happiness index is. He says, on quote, those sky high happiness surveys it turns out are mostly bunk. Asking people, are you happy, means different things in different cultures. In Japan for instance, answering yes seems like boasting. Booth points out, whereas in Denmark it's considered shameful to be unhappy, newspaper editor Anne Knudsen says in the book. Moreover, there is a group of people that believes the Danes are lying when they say they are the happiest people on the planet. This group is known as Danes. Over the years I have asked many Danes about these happiness surveys, whether they really believe that they are the global happiness champions, and I have yet to meet a single one of them who seriously believes it's true. Booth writes, they tend to approach the subject to the their much vaunted happiness like the victims of a practical joke waiting to discover who the perpetrator is. Again, much like Kevin D. Williamson touched upon the opinion surveys as mentioned in my video on the economic calculation problem, people often say things different to how they actually feel. You cannot determine how happy people are by asking people in surveys how they feel. People often give dishonest answers, it's a baseless assumption on a a sceptical human's part to claim that since there is supposed public provision of things like healthcare, then that must mean they are happy. A sceptical human mentions the usual Scandinavian countries. It's the same old overused nonsense. One of those countries he points to was Sweden. There is no greater country one could turn to for evidence of the difference between capitalism and socialism. Between 1870 to 1960, Sweden was a strong free market economy, it had extremely low levels of government regulation, low tax rates, a limited small government for most of that period, a strong private banking system, the absence of the big extensive welfare state and high levels of equality proven by the Gini coefficient. Leading into the 1960s, Sweden began laying on the strong government regulation, super high tax rates, heavy nationalisation, the economy stagnated as a result of failing to let failure fail and propping failure up in heavy currency devaluations as there was barely a private sector left, the country plunged into a crisis by the beginning of the 90s. As Thomas J. De Lorenzo points out in his book The Problem with Socialism, he says, on quote, the precipitous economic decline led to the revolt against the socialist regime. More conservative governments sharply reduced marginal income tax rates, abolished currency controls, deregulated bank lending, privatised several government enterprises, deregulated the retail, telecommunications and airline industries and implemented deep government spending cuts. Off quote. Most importantly, whilst we're on the subject of healthcare, Thomas J. De Lorenzo goes on to state, on quote, Despite Sweden's economic recovery after the mid-1990s, socialists might be surprised to learn that it's still poorer than Mississippi, the lowest income state in the United States. Another surprise for socialists is that Sweden has been privatising portions of its socialised healthcare, social security and education sectors and private health insurance is booming because of the inevitable rationing, shortages and long wait times of socialised healthcare. Folk, I can tell you firsthand that from experience and having, you know, been born and raised in Scotland, eh, a country with that of the NHS, that it's no different. Um, the likes of the SNP has actually conceded to the fact that they've actually been contracting out to private companies because they can't handle it. They're struggling as it is and it's all because of the massive big long waiting lines and that is their socialised healthcare system. What you can see is that it isn't as simple as erroneously pointing to Scandinavian countries and just calling it public healthcare as private initiatives were brought in for good reason. He doesn't tell you this however. People like a sceptical human 
turn to these Scandinavian countries and make it out as if they are these socialist utopias. But even Denmark began rolling back in its socialist policies. In 2001, Denmark began strong deregulation of its economy as people were voting favourably for free market reforms simply because 1.5 million of its 5.5 million population have been living off the welfare state, which is a very heavy burden laden on the high taxed working population in Denmark. You honestly think they're happy being taxed half to death? If so, why would the Danes set their own tax administration building on fire? When we look at Sweden, Norway and Denmark, Kevin Pham, a medical doctor and a contributor to the Daily Signal, says, on quote, the employee cost sharing for certain services, they are less comprehensive in their coverage and they allow for private health insurance plans to complement or supplement the government system to cover out of pocket expenses to circumvent wait times or rationed access to specialists. These are precisely the things Medicare for All would abolish. It's intriguing that while socialists in America would rush to nationalise the healthcare system, Norwegians, Swedes and Danes are all gradually increasing their use of private health insurance. Between 2006 and 2016, the portion of the population covered by private insurance increased by 4% in Sweden, 7% in Norway and 22% in Denmark. The increases in Sweden and Norway we are modest but not worthy considering that most out-of-pocket payments have a relatively low annual limit. Private plans in Sweden and Norway are mainly designed to supplement the government-run plan. In addition to covering out-of-pocket costs, these plans also guarantee prompt access to specialists or elective procedures which the state plans often fail to provide. Denmark also allows complementary insurance plans which cover services that are partially or not at all covered by the national system, including dental and vision services. This growing European interest in private health insurance typically stems from dissatisfaction with the state-run systems, which often provide poor or incomplete coverage and long wait times. By contrast, private plans offer wider coverage, shorter wait times, access to private facilities and more flexibility in patient choice. The NHS every single year since 1948 has been left with massive long waiting lines, shortage of doctors and nurses each passing decade. The excuses you hear today regarding the NHS are no different to what you've been hearing for the past 60 odd years. As for Finland, like the British NHS and all the other universal healthcare systems, everything comes at a cost. First check out this comedic tweet by Bernie Sanders as he says, on quote, In the United States it costs an average $12,000 to have a baby. In Finland it costs $60. We've got to end the disgrace to our profit driven healthcare system and pass Medicare for all, off quote. Folk, see anybody that hits it and says to you that it's not a for profit system and that, you know, something run for profits is a bad thing, they don't even have a clue about the fundamental basics of economics and I've covered before that when it comes down to profits and losses, it's required for the sake of efficiency and basically what profits are, it's basically telling you what consumers' wants are and what their needs are. That's what that is. It's, it's basically the information you gather from consumer demand, so if you oppose profits, you're basically opposing the consumer. His comedic tweet can easily be ripped apart by pointing out the fact that it is not as affordable as he may think it may be, but also that America's healthcare costs is in the main American healthcare market is anti-capitalist, all thanks to the third party payer system, over-regulation of the private sector and the AMA monopoly. The free market model of healthcare would humiliate the cost of health care argument by Bernie Sanders. Here we see the reality of the so-called free healthcare in light as the Washington Free Beacon states, on quote, the government of Finland collapsed Friday 
due to the rising costs of universal health care and the Prime Minister's failure to enact reforms to the system. Prime Minister Juha Zipula and the rest of the cabinet resigned after their governing coalition failed to pass reforms in parliament to the country's regional government and health services. The Wall Street Journal reports Finland faces an ageing population with around 26% of its citizens expected to be over 65 by the year 2030, an increase of 5% from today. Off quote. What government gives to you cannot give to you without taking from another first. The taxpayers' pockets are not a bottomless pit, and even that is never enough to make up for it. Therefore, having to cut services elsewhere to pay for it, it all mounts up. Not that this hasn't already been argued before by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. The thing that gets me about a sceptical human, he acknowledges the fact that the people are paying for the socialised healthcare systems he mentioned. He doesn't stop to think about the countries like Denmark and the cost of welfare for having 1.5 million of the population on the Danish welfare system out of a population of 5.5 million people. Norway, for example, has severe lack of productivity in their domestic economy due to being too heavily dependent upon the North Sea oil, which proves their economy is inefficient. They were the fifth largest oil export in Western Europe for six decades, yet Kongsberg Automotive only has 5% of their workforce left in Norway and they are working abroad in countries like China, Mexico and the United States because they can't afford to produce in their own home country. These countries have much higher unemployment levels, much greater than that of the official figures. Take Sweden for example, as Thomas J. De Lorenzo goes on to quote, on quote, while conservative reforms are restoring Sweden's economy, the social and economic effects of many decades of socialism will take years to undo. For instance, so many Swedes live off of government sick benefits and early retirement that the actual unemployment rate in Sweden is probably at least three times higher than the official government unemployment rate. The story is really no different to that of Denmark, as Thomas J. De Lorenzo goes on to mention, on quote, Denmark is another Scandinavian country that is trying with good reason to flee from its socialist past. More than a quarter of the working age population, 18 to 66, is on the government dole. For every 100 persons employed full time, there are about 60 working age welfare recipients, off quote. Another deeply flawed argument a sceptical human makes is then claiming how satisfied the patients are. Having been born and raised in Scotland, I've lost count of the amount of times I have heard people pissing and moaning about the service of the NHS, including people who typically are staunch supporters. It's not until it comes to a discussion on healthcare and those same people come to the defence of the NHS that you then hear the inherent con contradictions. The other issue with this argument is that the opinion of American people on American healthcare always comes down to American healthcare costs. Even if the argument is about quality, of course if these people are going to base American healthcare quality off of the perception of costs, then obviously they're not going to have such a high opinion of American healthcare. Let's see these same people turn to America's direct primary care model based off of the free market and then try saying all of what they do. As if a sceptical human hasn't already dug himself a deep enough hole, he continues on digging as he says, Crowder's ridiculous argument on this point is nothing more than a pathetic attempt to weasel his way out of the healthcare satisfaction data which makes absolutely clear that he is on the wrong side of this argument. If the satisfaction data indicated that countries with more progressive healthcare systems were deeply unsatisfied, and if the data showed that countries with private healthcare systems were much more satisfied, do you think that Steven Crowder would be dismissing this self-reported data? Yeah, it may look like this data supports my position, but here's why we can't trust it. 
There is not a chance that this would happen. He would cite this data in every single video he makes on healthcare until the end of time. Stephen Crowder is absolutely spot on, and what it proves to you is that a sceptical human really doesn't understand the difference between objective and subjective. He fails to comprehend the fact that people will more often than not base their subjective opinion on something when it comes to defending such a thing off of their own biased political stance. A sceptical human then goes on to cover some of the data from Peter G. Peterson Foundation, which is every bit as deeply flawed as that of his own healthcare argument. Why? The NHS was being bombed by taxpayers' money year in, year out. Glasgow was regarded as the heart attack capital of the world long after the NHS, costing a whopping £110 billion per year and the costs having been rising continuously. Even in the same chart, you can see the data for overweight people over the age of 15 and cancer deaths per 100,000 for people in the US. Yet, Britain, sitting with the NHS, has such a poor record on cancer and heart disease treatment that these problems have been common throughout the entire history of the NHS. Another thing to note is that the data being shown by Peter G. Peterson Foundation is irrelevant because people's poor health style choices, such as overeating, is nothing to do with how a healthcare system operates and performs. I can guarantee you, if the direct primary care system in America went nationwide and overtook the main American healthcare market, and it was completely free from state intervention, the direct primary care model would humiliate the current main healthcare market in the US, and you'd see those statistics change dramatically. I wouldn't even blame the NHS for an obesity problem leading to heart attacks, however, what I will blame the NHS for is its poor record on treating heart disease due to the long waiting lines and other issues. He then argues on the obesity rate of the United States question that perhaps it is the inadequacy of the healthcare system, but every country has a different culture and some countries eat healthier than others. You couldn't compare Italy or France who more often than not eat healthier foods than say Scotland. In Scotland we have a cultural problem of kids going to chippies eating deep fried foods for lunch which is why Glasgow ended up with the heart attack capital of the world. If a country has an unhealthier lifestyle choice to another the data is going to far outweigh that to the country of the healthier lifestyle. Is there a problem in the main American healthcare market? Yes especially a severe shortage of medical doctors. But who do you think engineered that problem? The government? What has that got to do with capitalism? Exactly nothing. In the next part video, I will cover on the American healthcare market costs and cover direct primary care as I feel it is important and contradicts this narrow argument. So I hope you enjoyed the argument folk. Here's some comments that I got from a previous argument on anarchism and of course to do with the private security. David Lewis goes on to say the idea of market monopolies coming into existence due to the dominant business providing a better product is so simplistic. I mean I've heard these you know monopoly myths persistently and you're always going to you know, hear that. Like I said, I mean, the only way a monopoly can actually form is basically by restricting productive output. That's something that doesn't seem to go down too well with some folk. The next comment by Proximism. Please do some debunking on Jack Angrich. I love your videos. Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. And of course, I will note that down for you and I'll get around to checking out, obviously, his videos. And, you know, the more that you guys actually provide me with with anything that then the more content I can put out. So PB says, Scotty, what are your thoughts on Ron Paul? Well, I'm a great admirer of Ron Paul, you know, much like that of Nigel Farage, he fought for more than 30 years, he's an honest guy in my opinion. I'm a great admirer of his work and I was sad to see that he didn't become the president, you know, he's blacked out by the mainstream media. I watched that and it was my friend in Louisiana that actually introduced me to, you know, the works of Ron Paul. Whether I agree with him on certain things or not, he's a very smart guy, he certainly knows his stuff. So anyway folks, uh, thank you to Pee Wee again 
for of course uh, his contribution and of course I will get around to doing other videos and I'll take note of any other ones there. Anyway folk, thank you for watching, I shall talk to you later. Cheers.